Hi, welcome to Infusion Health, the podcast. I'm comedian Chris Patrick, a.k.a. Self-Proclaimed Power Man. And I'm here with my co-host and significant other, Rach. Hey, guys. Now, today we got an interesting show. We're talking about child behavioral challenges. And we have Inel Billups calling in from Spring Hill, Tennessee. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you ever heard that song, uh, Too Nice to Talk. I think she's, uh, I think I might. <laughs> she's finishing up her doctorate degree in education and leadership. So, um <laughs> I don't know if I'm smart enough to talk to her. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, no. <laughs> Bring her on. No. Uh, okay, oh okay. okay, okay. And now, welcome to the show. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're finishing. You're finishing up. Let, let, you're finishing up your doctorate degree in um, educational and leadership. Yes, and specializing in special education with behaviors and disabilities. Okay, so so let's talk, let's talk about your background. Um, child behavior and, and challenges. What what are some of the things that go on with and what exactly explain your work and what are you doing? Who do you work and uh, what are the kids you work with? So I have a small company called Parents Advocating Love and Support Consultants. I do actually have a um, business partner as well, and we work with children that have disabilities, behaviors, challenges. We work with families. Our our biggest goal is to put parent education out there on working with our children with, um, to help them advocate for themselves, work with IEPs, which are the individualized edu- education plans, several four plans, learning how to conduct themselves in the meeting, knowing their rights. That's the biggest thing is really touching those parents and helping them. That's kind of what I do um, with our business. And I, I am in just my background, I've been an educator for 20 years and I've also worked in emergency medicine for 20 years as well. And so I've got to see, I've gotten the chance to see a lot of different behaviors, a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what brought me to this point. I have a a son, a bonus, my bonus baby. Um, He has a disability. And so when he came to us and my husband got custody of him, I knew absolutely nothing. I already had a child myself Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I do have a third one out, a little, a little young one, but when he came, I knew nothing about ADHD, nothing about developmental delays. I know knew nothing, and I was just like, "Wait, what?" Yeah. So when I was going into these meetings, I was like, I felt so by myself. I felt beat up on. I felt my poor child was getting beat up on. Mm-hmm. I felt like we were just getting ganged up on because I didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was like, how do I help him? Help this child who came from a, a really troubled childhood, a lifestyle, to now come into our home where we're a little more structured, a little bit more. So what do I do? Right. And so, so, so what, I what, had to go to school. So what, what did you what did you learn about uh, ADHD? Now, um, for for the listeners out there, ADHD is attention attention hyper deficit disorder. If I'm disorder. Mm-hmm. So so what, yep. what what are some things that that you didn't know that you learned about that was like oh like opened your eyes? That it comes with so much so much. It's actually a neurological um, disability. It's to do with the brain. Mm-hmm. I kept thinking, he's doing it because he want to do it. He know what he's doing. Right. It's those type of things, right? And I'm like, hey, come on now. You know, this I learned so much about it. Of, this is that. Yes. Yes. And a lot of it is not him. And he'll tell me, I don't know. I don't know why I do it. You ever get a kid to say, well, why did you do that? I don't know. Mm-hmm. You're thinking you do know. You did it because you, you know what you know what you're doing. No, we you really to do. <laughs> right. He has no idea. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. That was my biggest takeaway. Learned that it was a neurological disability. That it yeah. wasn't something that he was doing intentionally. Because you can tell the difference between a child doing something intentionally versus they really just don't know in their brain that made sense. I did it. Mm-hmm. So, so, so explain, that was my biggest takeaway. Well, explain. Um, ADHD as opposed to um, ADD because because I I I I know I got ADD I've never been tested for it but you know some of the things I do like you me know, and my children most of my children I've got five I have ADHD so 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 what's the difference between AD, ADHD and uh, what is it ADD 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 ADD, ADD attention and definite yeah. dis- deficit disorder so it may be controversial when I say this but I feel like honestly they would they've kind of put them together it's ADD and ADHD they're together Absolutely. so really one is more more it's three different types of it and they all they kind of I think they did it back in 1994. They kind of put it together, but we tend to separate the two. Mm-hmm. ADHD and ADHD kind of go together, and it comes with three different challenges, three di- different symptoms. Mm-hmm. The first one is inattentive, which is the ADD part. You're inattentive. You kind of do, you kind of go into your own world. You kind of you're not focused. You just kind of you'll be sitting there and just kind of go off into la la land, like into the space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's 
attention um, hyper deficit disorder, ADHD, where the child is very hyperactive. They just can't sit down. They're moving. They don't know what to do. They're fidgety. They're just, they're just, they just can't stop moving. And then there's the type that is a combination of both. Mm-hmm. So that's why I say they since then kind of put them together because it's three different types. You just have to know which category, almost like autism, you're on a spectrum. You just got to know in ADHD what category you kind of fall into. Okay. Well, like, well, like for me, um, there, there are times <clears throat> like Rachel was like, you can remember this, you can remember that, but you can't remember that. And then there are times when I'm sitting there. He can remember his rock bands and who played but he cannot remember what I told him last week. That's because I'm so that's because I'm so busy, you know, trying to get my business going and doing other things. I'm like, OK, yeah. But then I was like, OK, now what's this? And I, I got to re- reiterate it into my brain because it's like, yeah, you told me this, but I got to go do this. I got to go do this. I was like, yeah, OK, I got it. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> then it's like, OK, now what were we talking about again? Because <laughs> I got like 50 things going on into my mind. And that is definitely what ADHD, ADHD, ADD is. Those are exactly what it is. Your brain's got so much things going on. It's like um, picture a race car just going, going, going. And when it stops, you but you know, like how you say you can remember your favorite rock band. You can remember, it's because those are things that you can remember and you can process in your own way. Mm-hmm. Versus someone giving you something or giving you a direction, you can't really process it because of how it's being expressed to you. You're not receptive of it because communication comes with two ways of expressive and receptive. Mm -hmm. So with ADHD, it's how someone expresses something to you. So when she tells you something, you hear it, but you're like, it goes in one ear and out the other. And it's not intentional. It's just how your brain is trying to process that information. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's like, you know, the important stuff. It's like, I'm, I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. Yeah. You told me that, but then it's Mm -hmm. like, okay, what were were we talking? I told you that. I'm like, yeah. Well, I I think some parents need to understand how their child listens. How do they yes. recept up? Because yes. some parents just grab your face and say, this is what's going on. And some kids with ADHD, it still won't enter them. Maybe they need yep. to fidget with something for them to open up that listening. Like you need yep. to understand your child and how they recept it to be able to yes. express it. With it, and that's one of the things I had to learn with my son. And once I realized that every child is different, ADC is not going to be the same. Even adults, it's not going to be the same. Everyone's going to have something. You have to learn how to talk to them, and you have to learn how they're going to understand it. And so I had to start learning these things. I went back to school, and I had to learn and grow. And then that's what kind of where my um, specialty came in is that because I wanted to learn ways to help my child. And I'm like, if I can find ways to help my child, what parents don't know, I can help them, Yeah, you yeah. know, because they don't know. Yeah. And so that's what I had to do. I had to learn. My son does not understand the crap what I just said. Yeah. So we have to break it down. I have to give him one task at a time. I have to do task analysts. Like you can make cards, you can do visuals. There's so many things you can do for a child or even adults to understand. If you think about adults, we use visuals, do we not? When you go yeah. to a restaurant, if I gave you a menu with no pictures, Versus the many whip pictures, which one would you most likely be more attracted to look at and really order from? Yep. Mm-hmm. We need visuals. We need visuals when we see the stoplight. We need visuals when we know the speed limit. So think about these kids who cannot process information that well. They need visuals to break things out. And they need to be easy set. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so I like, think it's um, <laughs> strong to say that if you give them commands... Some of them can only hold one command at a time. Some can hold three, but don't go over three. After they finish right. their three chores that you ask them to do, then you need to reiterate with them if you want them to do more or what they, you want them to do because they've only hold it on to maybe one or two of those. Right. And I had to learn that. And it's so funny because my husband has learned a lot because he ha- he has ADHD too. But he's also an adult, so his adults just look a little different. So, like, he'll get so frustrated. He'll be like, do not just care. I said, but babe, listen, remember, you got to break it down. So he, I, I'm so proud because he's grown, too, and I had to kind of show him. And he's learned to just, all right, Jason, look. All right, first thing you're going to do is go pick up the toys off the floor and then come back. We got to break it down with him. Mm-hmm. A lot of things with behaviors and challenges that we see is a lot of patience on our end as parents, as adults. And I think we're in such a society where, like you even mentioned, we're just going, going, going. We have this project, that project, this business, that going. We never take the time to stop to try. We just expect our kids to go, 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 go. Yep. But a child whose brain cannot function like that, they cannot go, go. you got to stop. And that, and that makes us have to shift the way we think and the way we do things in our limited beliefs on behaviors and how to handle our children. And I think it's important not to label them. 
You have ADHD, right. so you cannot accomplish this goal, this goal, this goal. You have to find out what they're interested in because they will often excel in what they're interested in. Well, that's the thing, because um, when when I found out later, like I said, I've never been tested for it. But ADD, when I found out about ADD, I saw a thing on um, people with ADD and some people with ADD have become very successful. The guy who owns a JetBlue Airlines, mm-hmm. he has ADD. And he he's been tested for it. He goes, yeah, I know I got ADD, but he's a millionaire, so there's, it, it's not right. it's not a setback. It's just something that you know. Mm-hmm. And that's why I tell my son. I say, he said, why why am I so different? I said, that's because you're blessed. That's just because you look at things, you look at the world differently the way that I would look at it. It's nothing wrong with the way that you think of something. You just have a more intricate way of looking at it than I would. There's nothing wrong with that. So now, first, going on, what are some of the other behavioral challenges that you work with? I work with children um, that deal with tantrum, but I've had a couple clients, like I have some of the younger ones, they're like, how do I deal with this tantrum? They say terrible too, he's like three or four and he's still doing it. Mm -hmm. Like, what do I do? You know, I've worked with that. I've worked with children um, who just can't sit down, children who have autism and parents understanding, well, how come I can't do this? What can I do at home? You know, so I've, I've dealt with a lot of different behaviors. Right now I work, um, not only do I have my business, but I also work for the DCS system um, here in Tennessee, where we work in the foster care unit. And I work with a lot of different children, even teenagers, dealing with some of those behaviors and things that they deal with. And I have foster parents that will call me and they'll say, oh, my gosh, I know. Okay, she just went off. She just started throwing stuff and she's going crazy. I don't know what to do. And I always tell parents and tell everybody, there's a function to that behavior. She did not just re- Something is deeper going on that she could not tell you. Mm -hmm. So this is how she's expressing it. Is it okay for her to express it that way? No, but there's a reason for it. Always a function to a behavior. When a child does something, when any of us do something as adults, when we do something, we come in and we're frustrated and we're just upset about something. There's always something that may have happened prior to you walking back in the house. And then when you go off on someone, they think it's something they did, but it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was something that happened before I even got into this. So I think we all, when we see behaviors, there's always going to be a reason to it. It could be a sensory thing. It could be an auditory thing. It could be the fact that they're just, they're sad and they're just, or they feel forgotten or they're hungry. We just have to figure out what that issue is or why that behavior is happening. And that's talking to the parents. How about the child itself when they're going through that tantrum or my children um, also suffer from anxiety disorder? How do you center them in those moments? So I, I learned, I took this class, and one of the doctors talked about how when it comes to tantrum, it comes to those things, we're in four different elements of the earth. There's fire, water, earth, and air. And with fire, that's the most common tantrum we see, right? That's when they're falling on the ground, they're throwing them tantrums, they're kicking everything on the kitchen floor. Then the water one is where their brain is off, and but they're still able to kind of communicate with you, but they're whining a lot, and they're in that space where they're just kind of crying. Mm-hmm. But when they're in that fire stage, their brain is completely cut off. You cannot talk to them. You cannot reason with them. You're going to have to let that tantrum play out at that point. The point, the re- before they get to that point, you have to figure out what it was that triggered it so that when it happens again, we can stop it before we get to that fire sign. Sure. And then there's the earth sign, so we could call it the hard earth. That's the one when the brain is usually online, but you get that, no, I don't want to do it. No, whatever. No, I don't feel like doing it. That's that hard earth. And then there's the air sign, which is our 88 years or our kids who can't really think or who can't commit. It's kind of like their brain function is on, but it's just kind of like, la, 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 la. you know, they're just in that. So I, always, I have to look at cancer and look at behaviors and anxiety and things like that. Because if you look at it and you figure out, well, what element are they in? What part are they in right now? That's how you'll be able to go ahead and handle that situation. So if you have a child that has an anxiety, but they're just whiny and they're crying and they just don't know what to do. Most of the time, their, their brain is on and off, and you just can't get through. So you kind of just kind of you'll learn how to kind of work through it. So if their brain, if they're crying and it's not like a hard cry, you could probably talk with them. You can console them. You can, but if they're just really having this yelling, ah, you know, at that point, their brain, their brain is totally shut off from anything that you're going to say. So you kind of have to let it play out. You give them a quiet area where they can kind of get themselves together, and then you come back and revisit and try to talk to them. But how do you, how do you? Um... I don't know if that's how do you work with kids like, OK, as far as as far as being kids, but then when they get into adulthood, when they go to college, when they when they go to their jobs, um, how do you how do you teach them to deal with what they got to do to um, to be better at their jobs and be better at college? 
So I'm working actually with one a, a young lady who's 18 who is going to college now. And so a lot of things, I'm coming in towards the end of everything. What, what, what will really help is if we had to start this stuff at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So like my teenage boys, I'm starting now showing them how to deal with certain things, how, do, how the world works, how do we work. If we start, the earlier you start, the better it will be for them and for you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important versus you. It's, it's a little more difficult, but you have to be a little more patient because at 18, 19, they've already kind of got their brain set to what they're going to do. This is my way, no way. But you have to, again, it goes back to us being more patient, taking the time, breaking things down, and sometimes being hands-on with them and modeling what we want them to do and showing them what to do so that they can be successful. Mm-hmm. So, so you got you got one that's going to college. What is he? What is he studying? Well, not it's not my not not, not my hers, child. One it's one of my foster kids. One okay. of my foster kids is going. She's going to college, and so she is at the point where she was not taught a lot of those things. So, me and her foster mother now are working with her now, and she has a couple of um, people at the school, and she has one person with the state helping her because she needs a whole team of people. It takes a team. It takes a village, mm-hmm. and so she needs that. And I think that goes for any child. They need a village. They can, mm-hmm. you, you can't do it by yourself. You need, you need each other to kind of survive and go through this. And so I think because she has a village working with her and helping her through it and being consistent, all it, consistency is the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Being consistent is going to help her to succeed. Mm-hmm. So how does, how does like um, things like electronics, because I, I noticed with electronics, you know, kids got their cell phones in front of their face all the time. Mm-hmm. You go anywhere, and you, yeah. you see kids and they got these, it's like, you guys put these things down and talk to each other. You know? Right. This world is so technology driven. So there is a there's websites that help with like family management, with management with technology. If parents, because there's some parents like it all the time. It's like they're in the video games. I, I don't know what to do. And then they get a temptation when I turn it off. So a lot of that, I have to tell them it's your fault because why we just let them do it. Why do we let our kids get on? Because it's quiet, it quiet them down. I can do what I got to do and they're fine. But now when I need them to do something and we go take them off, it's a whole big thing. Yeah. So for us in my house, not, and I would say in my house, what me and my husband is, we have rules. Monday to Thursday, you do no video games. Video game is a luxury. It's not something that you can just do every day. It's a reward. It's something you do on the weekends. Monday to Thursday, you should be doing something with school, reading a book. We, we don't even do a lot of television during the weekday. Mm. We do reading. We spend time together. We go outside. We do, we, you can play family games. But you have to kind of shift the dynamic of your household and to shift the way that, the way you want things to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I always tell people with parents when they say, "Well, he's he's when they'll, they'll say, okay, we did the first week, but it didn't go well. He he was upset. He threw this." I always tell it takes you twenty one days to break an old habit, and about three four months for you to really get used to a new habit. Mm-hmm. So it's going to take that child some time to get used to this room is new. My mama said, "I cannot play my video games until Friday. How am I going?" It's going to take them a minute, but once you stay consistent, and I always, that word I'm going to keep saying because I think in our society, we don't stay consistent. We start off and then we say, oh, it doesn't work. Right. We want this miracle thing for it. There's snap our fingers and it's going to work. Mm-hmm. Stay consistent, stay patient, and hold your ground. And, and things will start to shift. Eventually, that child's going to get it. Now, if you have a child that has a disability, it's going to take a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be as easy, especially if their brain is just, used, you're going to have to really rinse and repeat. Take your time. Try not to yell. I know it's easier said that because you get frustrated. Trust me, I know. But try not to yell. Try to really just stick your ground. Like with my son, he'll say, um, I want this. Well, no, you can't have that right now. We're going to eat dinner. But I, nope, after dinner. But I, nope, just, I'll keep repeating it. Eventually, he'll be like, okay. And he walks away. He's like, I got it. Just after dinner. Hold your ground. Do not give in. <laughs> you know? I think it's also important to for the parents to have a timeout. I know that yes. when my kids get me in that mood, I'm like, okay. And I used to blow my top after that point, but nobody learns anything. And feelings right. just get hurt. So I'm like, right now, you do not want me to talk to you. You do not want me to have this conversation with me. You, I said no. Step away from mm-hmm. me so I can calm down and we will calm right. back together when I am calm. Right. And you know, the best thing about that, I love that because you're teaching them how to deal with their emotions. You don't even realize, like you're modeling, okay, they'll know because you think some of these kids that got these angers that just go in, they weren't taught, I need to take a minute. They're not realizing that I'm not in this space of being able to reason or talk. 
if mommy and daddy's doing it, then I know that I can do it. You just model such a perfect way to deal with emotions and tantrums and things like that. That was such a perfect, perfect thing. Because then you will take your time away, they'll come back, and then you guys come together and be like, okay, now let's talk about it. So I love that. I can't say that I'm always great at it, but I've learned through experience that that is the best Mm -hmm. way to deal with everything. Yep. And I have to do that with my children, too. I'll tell my little eight-year-old, he'll be like, Mommy's not upset with you, but she just needs a moment so we can talk about this. And Mm you'll feel like it's him, and I have to tell him it's not you. Give Mommy about five minutes. And then we'll come back, you know what I mean? And we'll talk together. Okay, so so um, let's go back to the beginning. Okay, your child is born. At what age do you, or when do you start to find out that he may have ADHD or um, a, a, <laughs> hyper ADHD or ADHD? So or any, any, kind of, any, 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 any type of disability. Yeah. That's such a great question. So um, what we've taught a lot of teachers and, and parents is normally the average age is between six to eight where they actually are diagnosed. Mm-hmm. But when you really find out a child has something going on, especially like autism or something going on, usually it's the first year. Parents always know something's different. That child has not hit that milestone. Something's not right. Especially if you've had other children, you'll know my child was walking by then. They're three and they're not talking. They're not walking. Something's wrong. Parents usually know before you bring them to a provider or whatever. They usually know. But they're not fully diagnosed until they're a little until later on. Mm-hmm. And a lot of places, depending on where you go, they don't want to diagnose children with ADHD early on because why? It could just be that they're going through a phase in their kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you, and they can grow out of it and grow, you know what I mean? Like my, my eight-year-old, the his teacher told me, and if, if I didn't know what I knew then, which I'm glad I knew, right. he said he has ADHD. He won't sit down. I'm like, mm, no, nope, I don't think he has ADHD. You're in denial. No. Nope. Come to find out the program he was in, all they do is make him sit, 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 and and do worksheets. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, children yeah. can't sit. Nobody can sit. I can't sit mm-hmm. no. for hours on end. <laughs> you know? no. so, it, has to be a good really, it has to be a really good movie. And I think that's a really <laughs> right. strong point to reiterate. Some of these ADHD, other behaviorals, need to express themselves through getting rid of that energy, finding the sport that's right for them, not even just a sport, just going out for a walk or run or it, getting that energy out of their body. Yes. I'm so glad you said that. I actually have a, um, I have a parenting and teen challenge workbook that I have and it's free for a lot of parents. And one of them is the section called when I can't stop moving, keep me moving. People think with children ADHD, sit them down. They gotta be still. That's what that, that'll keep them. No. Keep them moving in a more organized way. Mm-hmm. They have this part of their brain that's called proprioception. That's their, another part of their senses. And that's just their body not being aware of things. So they're either a sensory seeker or a sensory um, avoider, where if they're a sensory seeker, they're jumping all over the place. They're jumping off the air. They're doing this. If they're avoider, avoiding senses, they'll cover their ears with loud noises. They won't touch anything. And so you have to do things that are going to help them organize that part of their brain. And so I tell them there's this thing called heavy work. And people ask me, well, what is heavy work? What, what, what does that do? That is great for children who have ADHD, who are sensory seekers or sensory avoiders. Those are simple things you could do around the house. Like I have my son, I'm like, all right, go bring the laundry basket down to the laundry room. All right. We just actually moved into a new place. And so him helping us move heavy objects, mm-hmm. pushing and pulling, that helps his brain get organized. The more physical activity you do, the better it helps to organize your brain. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But we're but it's sad because we're in such a society where, like you said, we're in video games and computers and phones. Get those kids outside and move and have a good time. Like you said, go to a sport. Get them involved. The more you, the more active they are out there in sports, doing things around the house and not just sitting around, it starts to organize the brain. Well, but I think it's, it's important to that. say it's in a sport that they appreciate. So you, you've explored yes. what your child uh, it likes, not throwing them yes. into support that they're never right. going to appreciate because then you see more behaviors. Yep. And then they're not going to want to do it. Right. And then some of the things like my son, he's the type of person you have to be careful of that too, because he'll say he won't do anything just because he doesn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. And I have to be like, just try it. Nope. I don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. he, but then he does it. And guess what? He loves, loves it. it. So you also kind of got to just let him try it. Let him try it once. And if yeah. they try it, like my other son, he tried football. He did it for two years. He's like, no, nah, I'm good. Okay. But he tried it. I want you to try it, you know? Don't make them do it and then keep doing it. If they try it for the first season and they're like, okay, mom, this is not it, then move on to the next. But at least let them try. 
But yeah, but what what about like a, a lot of a lot of kids? They they go to these schools and they um they got ADHD or ADD, and then the teacher and the principal get with the parents and go, oh, throw uh, give them Ritalin. What do you think about that? Because I think that is like the worst thing you you should be giving to kids. So I think that if we and and we did dealt with this with our son, that was one of the things that really had sent me cry cry many a times. And she's like, you just need to give him medicine. He's out of control. Yes. And that hurts a parent. And yeah. and I want to tell parents too, you have to know your rights. They a school is not allowed to tell you to give your child anything. No. Nope. Exactly. You know your exactly. rights. They, they are, are not allowed to do with that. that one. Yep, I did. I have you to You can't with that tell one. me but I didn't know that. That was one of the things I didn't know. Yes. I was listening to him like, what is it? It's, I have to research. No, you are allowed to ask questions and you're allowed to fight and advocate for your child. So I always tell the, all the parents, depending on the situation, medicine is not always a cure-all. You have to do some tools, some strategies, and things to help with that child. Medicine can help, yes. but it's not going to cure that child. You have to start giving them some things to help them. So one of the things that I did, um, and I give to my parents, and I give these out to some of my kids all the time, is giving them the seat cushion, the sensory cushion, to sit on their chair in school. I give them fidgets. Um, we have a little chair bands, a little, they're like stretchy bands. You put them on the chair and they can kick their foot with it. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things. My son, he has a bunch of little fidgets that he's allowed to bring to school to help them. Mm -hmm. He is on medication now, but at the beginning, we really wanted to try everything. We were doing therapy. We are doing all kinds of things, occupational therapy, things like that we were doing. But because um, a lot of times he had a lot of mental things that happened in his past growing up, that kind of brought him to where he is. So we also have to look at that too, that the mental part of things, trauma, things that kids go through can play a big part of why they are the way they are in their behaviors. So you have to kind of decipher the two. So for him, his was a little different. So we did give him some medicine. We put him on Adderall, but a very low dosage. But on, and on top of him doing the Adderall, I actually do tools and things for every single day. He has a visual schedule out for his chores, visual schedule out in the bathroom for how he's going to do things. So you have to do tools and stuff. Medicine is not a cure-all. It's not going to make them feel better. They're going to make them like zombies. They're not going to know what to do. You have to know your management, medication management with those kids. Don't let your doctors and people say, give them all this medicine. No. That's kind of what we started them off with like five milligrams. As he got older, it did change mm -hmm. because he's growing. Mm -hmm. But we, he right now, he's only on like 20 milligrams. No, I mean 15 milligrams of um, Adderall. That's it. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be 15. And we just work with him and give him tools. And if he has staff, and, and we're lucky where we live, we, he has a, a special education team that works with him, that understands him. If you have that and, and you have a team like that, he can be successful. But a lot of places don't have that, which is sad. A lot of schools, a lot of teachers, they, they don't have the patience. So that's why they right. say give medicine. Yep. Mm -hmm. But yep. it's also they're like, I'm trying to deal with this kid, and I'm dealing with your right. kid because of this behavior. Why don't you just give him medicine? Right. And it's like, okay, but, but there's a lot of other natural things that I can be mm, doing yes. with my children before yes. I put them on a medication. So let me try those yes. natural ones and see if my son and or then, daughter still needs that medication. And that's what we did. And then we really, after we tried everything for years, it wasn't don't try it for like two months. And say, okay, no, you have to really, it's trial and error work and try and is a lot of patience you just got to do it and teachers and i mean in cinema falls are on a lot of these teachers are general education teachers uh -huh. they are not trained in special education so they don't know but like for me i was lucky to have both i have general education and special ed education so when i taught in my classroom i had it i had a sensory area i had a um a quiet area i had fidgets i had sensory seats i had because i know these kids can't sit even uh -huh. if they don't have any fear have they just can't sit and I feel like, why is this a big deal that they have to sit in the seat? As long as you've taken that test and done a task, if you're doing a standing up, I don't care. You got it done. Right. Yeah. A lot of behaviors will cut down if it's not a power struggle. A lot of adults want this power struggle. They have to do it my way or no way at all. Then you will continue to have these behaviors. You're going to continue until you start working with your child and realizing, even with my son, you know what? He swept the floor. He may have swept the floor hopping on one foot. Don't care, but he swept the floor. Why am I going to make a big deal because he's hopping on one foot? You get what I'm saying? I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, I know that um, teaching them to, mm, tips and tricks also help. When me and Chris first moved into the house with his AD, AD, mm, ADD and my ADHD, we kept on losing the keys to the house in the cars. 
<laughs> and, and we're like, I don't know where I put them. So Chris bought some hooks that go up in the kitchen. And then we we're like, oh, that's where the keys are. That's where the keys always go. And that's where the kids have learned. Okay, that's yes. where the keys go. And every single time, the, my daughter is a driver now. And she's like, where's the keys? They're not where they belong. And she's talked to me about... um how she always leaves things behind in the car. And I said, well, I had to teach myself to check my body and check my car before I shut the door. Mm -hmm. So do I, okay, what am I doing today that I need out of my car? I need my keys. If I'm working, I need my badge. I need this. I need that. If I'm going to enjoy the sun, do I have my sunglasses? Do I have my keys? Do a body check before I shut the door because I guarantee you I will leave something behind. The other day, my daughter was taking the car and I'm like, I forgot my badge in the car. (laughs) (laughs) So I think it's important when kids, even at a very young age, did you put everything in your bag? Do you have your computer in there? Do you have your books in there? Do you have your pencils in there? Okay, now as you're leaving, where did you put your shoes? Where did you put this? Where did you put that? Because I guarantee you, I got so many calls. Mom, I left this behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is definitely. And I love what you just said. How What you just did, it was task endless. You just broke everything down to small and stuff. And you took a minute to stop and think, what do I have to do? And that's one of the things I tell my son. We, and I told kids to stop, think, and then react. Stop. Yeah. Think about what you need to do, then react to it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we have for him. We have visual. Like I said, visuals are like the best friend for children. Visuals will help break things down completely. And that's, we have a checklist. Right? What do you go down? He said, yep, I have this. I did that. He said, I got everything. Because then that helps him be more independent. And it also helps you not to continue not to be there kind of like that helicopter parent or that mm-hmm. parent that's like all the way. And it gives you, a parent as a parent, a way to kind of, kind of let go a little bit. Because yeah. he feels more independent. Like, I got this. I got my checklist. I do it. Yeah. As adults, though, like you said, you're an adult. You can know to stop. Wait, okay, do I have my bag? Do I have this? You can stop and do that. But kids, they can't. So that's our job to give them a visual, a checklist, something that they can use so they can feel that independence to be like, okay. And then eventually they won't need that visual because they'll just know the routine. Like you said, the keys always go here, right? Yep. 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 Well, this has been an interesting conversation. And like, and like she said, um, parents out there, um, they want to put your kids on any kind of drugs. You do have options, and the school cannot tell you. So make sure you do your research and all that. And um, I'll let Rach close us out. All right. Oh, and then, uh, thanks a lot for being on the show. We've learned a lot. And um, uh, maybe we'll have you on again. Who knows? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you guys, it's come to an end again. Know your child. If they're going through something, find out what it is. And maybe it's not the right moment for you. Give yourself that break and reiterate with that child. That that quick reaction can be so traumatizing. But if you go back and make a personal connection, it will mean everything in their future. Have a great one. Take it easy.